This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. Alone in a dark forest, does the sudden hush of woodland critters frighten you? Are you really alone? There are a pair of fairly common reactions to any new astronomical phenomena. The first is to see such an anomaly outside our current understanding and assume it's proof of alien life. The second is seeing that anomaly and saying it is certainly of natural origin and any suggestion to the contrary is absurd. Now, neither reaction exists in a vacuum. Of course, nothing does exist in a vacuum which is essentially our topic for the day in an astronomical context, but also in a human context. On the discussion of the existence of aliens, both reactions are from decades of folks contemplating the topic of the Fermi Paradox, the seeming contradiction between the sheer size and age of the Universe and the apparent absence of any other intelligent life in it. Those two reactions I mentioned, this is aliens and this is definitely not aliens, aren't really the ground state of either reaction, and indeed the second is more of a reaction to the first. The first is generally initially simply intrigue, We've got something we can't explain and we wonder if maybe it's a sign of something unnatural and artificial, whereas the other might be regarded as an exasperated reaction to how often folks jump to that conclusion even after all the times it's turned out otherwise. Two of the phenomena that most often grab attention as possibly artificial are the cosmic voids, immense regions of nearly empty space far larger than any galaxy, and the occasional stars in our own galaxy which seem to be fading out or disappearing entirely for a variety of reasons, with some for reasons we don't know. Since the usual approach of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is to hunt for things like radio signals, inhabited worlds, or other clear signs of life, it can seem a bit counterintuitive that we would look at big empty spaces or missing stars and say that was a sign of life. However, this essentially boils down to the concept of the Kardashev Scale, something we call the Dyson Dilemma, and a bit of a misunderstanding about both. The Kardashev Scale is an approach to measurement of a civilization's power usage, with astronomical detection in mind. See our episode on the Kardashev Scale for further discussion of what such immense civilizations might be like. Civilizations are assumed to need energy and be bound by the laws of thermodynamics, meaning they don't use energy up but merely take energy in, get some work done with it which transforms it into a higher entropy state of energy and emit that as waste heat. There is nothing to permit convection or conduct heat away in the vacuum of space, so heat must be dissipated via radiation as photons of light coming off from the object instead. In the case of inhabited planets this would be expected to be infrared photons of the wavelengths associated with terrestrial temperature thermal emissions, or LWIR, long wave infrared. Generally those temperatures you'd get when water is a liquid, not ice or gas. Though the official region for LWIR is negative 80 to 89 Celsius, or a wavelength of 8 to 15 micrometers. I want to emphasize that because it can be a bit confusing talking about waste heat and radiation in infrared. The visible light our sun produces, that warms us and serves as the ultimate engine for our life on Earth, represents a tiny band our eyes can see splitting much larger bands of radiation, the infrared and the ultraviolet, a skinny little river separating two big nations. In truth it's more like the Mississippi River separating the East and West United States as the processes associated to making infrared and ultraviolet light are more or less the same, whereas the other major bands of photon radiation like X-ray, gamma, and radio tend to be produced by different physical processes like nuclear fission or fusion in an atom's core for gamma. All of the light from the Sun originates as nuclear fusion producing energy that gets absorbed by the gases in the Sun, which then re-emit it as waste heat, just at a much smaller wavelength than LWIR. Regardless, while our Sun produces a lot of visible light, it actually produces more infrared than visible light, it's just a much more energetic zone of infrared than LWIR, the infrared region known as NIR or near-infrared, being near the visible light region of the spectrum. Generally using light as a power source is going to result in absorbing photons in shorter and more energetic wavelengths, and re-emitting them as longer and less energetic photons, and you do have to re-emit them as your temperature would keep rising otherwise, till you baked in your own waste heat, though we'll discuss some hypothetical alternatives to that today too. 
In regard to the culture of scale, the notion is that civilizations use up sunlight to run themselves, converting that into infrared light of wavelengths associated with their effective ambient temperature, which we generally assume would be in that LWIR range. This results in a lot of misconceptions though, as some will say that a culture of two civilization for instance, one which uses up all the light of its sun, would be invisible. It's not, and indeed it isn't using up all that light. It's merely using all that light and converting it into LWIR wavelengths, its waste heat. Incidentally, a Kardashev of one civilization is one that uses up all the energy of a planet, and a Kardashev of three is one that uses all the sunlight of an entire galaxy. These are very broad ranges, and only useful in a SETI astronomical alien hunting context, and a Kardashev of two or K2 civilization, one using up all its star's energy, would be highly variable since our Sun for instance is much brighter than most stars, some which are thousands of times dimmer than our Sun, while the really big giants can be a million times brighter than our Sun. A K2 around the dimmest of red dwarfs and one around the brightest of supergiants would vary as civilizations in scale as much as a single person in a log cabin to an entire planetary population. The Kardashev scale is very popular for talking about advanced civilizations and trying to contrast them, indeed we did an episode talking about what such civilizations can do, but as we pointed out there, it really is an awful system for trying to compare this or that hypothetical or fictional civilization to each other, like with the Kardashev designation for your favorite interstellar empire from a sci-fi book or TV series is. Also, we don't actually tend to assume they'd be invisible even in the visual spectrum, just way dimmer. They might capture every single visible light photon coming out their own sun, but they probably would not, and would probably re-emit more from this or that artificial source. The general notion is that they are just way dimmer, and only in the usual spectrum, they are just as bright as before, only the brightness is in the LWIR range. Now the means for this capture is generally assumed to be a Dyson Swarm, a big cloud of orbiting satellites and constructs around a star, that each absorb and use some light and emit some waste heat infrared. This is also known as a Dyson Sphere, but since that term tend to get borrowed and distorted in science fiction to mean a single solid spherical shell around a star, full of artificial land on the inside, we tend to stick with Dyson Swarm instead and a Dyson around a star would be characteristic of a K2 civilization. The Kardashev scale assumes a civilization would tend to build such things around their own home star over time, making it slowly dim in the visual range and brighten in the infrared, and colonize other stars and eventually Dyson those up too, eventually gains their whole galaxy which would be a K3 civilization, one that was invisible visually, or very dim anyway, but very bright in that LWIR infrared range. This is the Dyson Dilemma of the Fermi Paradox incidentally, since if we assume that civilizations like to grow, they grow to other planets and other solar systems, and are operating under known physical laws, eventually they should become a K1, then a K2, then a K3, and in the process dim all those stars down to non-visible emission. In the Dyson Dilemma, we don't look out at the stars and wonder if they're inhabited, instead we wonder why we can even see any stars at all since with billions of years of head start and billions of billions of stars to work with, you expect them all to have been turned into Dyson Swarms long ago. That they haven't been is a bit of a dilemma, since it implies some core assumptions of science we make, be it Darwinian evolution or basic biological imperatives or the laws of thermodynamics, or some other core assumption, is just wrong. So this is where the voids and disappearing stars comes in, because if you see a star getting dimmer over time, or disappearing, well that's what you'd expect from a civilization busy englobing that star. The slight mistake being made usually assuming that a star would actually disappear rather than just change colors as it were. Any massive supervoids in the universe would look a lot like a K3 or even K3 plus civilization that englobed a vast stretch of space. Now often that is the end of that consideration, since such voids are not gushing out galaxies worth of infrared so obviously aren't trillions of classic Dyson Swarms surrounding all the stars in a clump of galaxies, but there's also the thought that since that infrared signature has to do with heat and entropy, and the big problem on the mind of any vast and ancient galactic empire would be how to manage heat and defeat entropy, that the infrared waste glow might be a missing feature on a huge and ancient empire sprawling over many galaxies as they would have solved that problem. Now for my part, I don't really expect anyone will ever solve the problem of entropy, and if they did, they really wouldn't need to bother with englobing stars anyway, but it has been suggested you might be able to use black holes to absorb infrared waste heat, 
by simply having a layer of infrared reflective panels and pale bulk dishes that reflected the LWIR heat into the black hole. The thermodynamics of black holes is rather uncertain currently and they may actually violate thermodynamics in whole or part. They probably do not, but we can't actually rule it out yet. In any event, this wouldn't likely be a total solution, allowing you to completely eliminate energy loss or turn invisible, but it would make you a lot dimmer, and the cosmic voids aren't actually totally empty of light anyway. Of course that's the other issue, the voids aren't true voids, and we might as well say what they are now. The Universe is not homogeneous and evenly distributed, any more than our solar system or galaxy is. If you zoom out far enough to what we call the end of greatness, it is but not when you're smaller. The end of greatness is the scale of the Universe, a few hundred million light years across, in which everything is still unique but more in the way people or soap bubbles or snowflakes or trees are unique from each other. The end of greatness is essentially the zoom out scale at which you're seeing the forest as a green blob. We do have some things which are that size or bigger, seeing as you might have a forest glade that was clearly visible as empty in that green blob, but by and large it all looks like a blob zoomed out to that scale. I reference soap bubbles as an analogy though and as best as we can tell our Universe is arranged more like soap bubbles, with the soap film itself being where most of the galaxies are. Cosmologists have been working to figure out why the Universe formed this way since we noticed the distribution, why we get long strings, filaments, and walls of galaxies and big regions of emptiness, but the key thing is that these regions, these voids, aren't empty at all, they're just much lower density. Same as if you look at a nighttime image of Earth and you see lots of bright lights at the cities and major seaboards and rivers where people tend to congregate, but still have lights and people further away from there. There are plenty of galaxies and stars in voids, they're just far less common. Indeed you have plenty of stars in the more mundane intergalactic voids between galaxies too, just far less than galaxies, but the big cosmic voids are even more thinly distributed than that. Nonetheless, they are in there, and there's no reason a civilization swallowing up whole galaxies into Dyson swarms would bypass big clumps of stars in their expansion and produce that effect. Moreover, as we said, englobing a star this way doesn't make it dimmer, it just switched the light to infrared. And we can't see that with our eyes, but our telescopes can, and we noticed that these voids were freakishly bright in LWIR wavelengths. Now, as a caveat, while I often say on this show folks will probably tend to go this Dyson route with stars and growth, that's not really a complete image. The notion is more that with a star in a solar system producing all that light and burning all that fuel, and generally making up at least 99% of that solar system's mass, folks will want to use that star. They don't necessarily use it as just a big power source, they might disassemble it via star lifting or slow feed it into artificial black holes and store all that mass and energy for far slower release for a longer lived civilization. Indeed such a slow release would not only mass the infrared signature by massively decreasing it, it's likely to shift out of the LWIR range of light into the far infrared, those wavelengths of light emitted by very cold objects like Pluto or even as the microwave range. You can see the civilizations at the end of time episode Black Hole Farming or Postponing the Heat Death of the Universe for more details on why this would be the case and how it functions. But in a nutshell, a post-biological civilization, essentially one where everyone has uploaded their minds to computers, benefits from running at very cold temperatures, each joule of energy gives you way more computational power when you're running ultra-cold, and so a vast and ancient empire planning to be around a long time might have converted over to this hyper-efficient approach to computation, thought, and life, and as such would probably show up only as a small glow of far infrared or maybe even microwave wavelengths as they are intentionally going low power, low temperature, ultra-efficient, and long-lived. This is what really caught the eye of astronomers and futurists a couple decades back when the supervoids got discovered, because we found some voids that were far larger than the normal ones and bigger than the end of greatness scale. We could not think of how they would form naturally, at the time anyway, and we were simultaneously getting into serious contemplation of post-biological existence like mind uploading that got a bit garbled and simplified in a lot of discussions, but essentially it was that we were seeing a few voids too big to naturally form in our current understanding of the Universe and we couldn't see them very well. As an example, you can also detect large objects and constructs, especially galaxy-sized things, by their gravitational influence on their neighbors, and we didn't really have a good enough picture at the time to see if the voids' gravitational influence on the areas around them matched the expected amount from what the stars and galaxies we could see inside them. 
plus they weren't very well mapped initially to even see a lot of those occasional galaxies. Such astronomy is very difficult, and we only had the most limited knowledge of dark matter and energy at the time, so it made it quite a guessing game with big margins of uncertainty. As time passed we could see more such voids and see them and their galactic neighbors better, and we also could start seeing how time passed for these voids. Astronomy is history, and if I can see something like a void 12 billion light years away, then I am seeing a void 12 billion years ago. Since the Universe is only about a couple billion years older than that, we not expect to see giant civilizations present back then making such voids, and we do see them, only they are smaller. Now at first, that is a positive sign for life. Things which might be artificial and which get more common or larger over time match the profile for life as they are growing. We call this T, or the Time Elapse Argument, that any phenomena which is more common in the past or bigger is presumably not an artificial one since you'd expect a growing civilization and its artificial constructs and centrals to get bigger and for more examples of them to pop up in the Universe over time. And again astronomy is history so we can see the past. We can find a strange phenomena and look at all the objects 1-2 to two billion light years away of that type, and compare them to all the ones at 2-3 to three billion light years away and 3-4 to four and 4-5 to five and so on and see if the density is higher, lower, or the same in the patches near us in space and time. If it is a higher density or size in the regions closer to us, which is to say more common as time passed by, then a phenomena would pass muster with T, the time elapse argument as the phenomena would grow bigger or more common as the Universe aged and life presumably got more common and had more time to grow intelligent and engage in interstellar and intergalactic colonization. So quasars for instance, which are a phenomena that some attributed to intelligent critters when we first started finding them, don't pass muster under T because they were more common in the past. As we found out with more study, they are the product of vast amounts of matter falling into big and hungry black holes at the centers of galaxies. Alternatively, those big central black holes found in the centers of many galaxies, which grow over time as they eat more material, would pass muster under T, because they are getting bigger with time. However, we have a perfectly natural reason why they do, they're just eating up matter, though they are also likely the sorts of places you would find major civilizations migrating to, see our episode Colonizing Black Holes for why. Anyway, those vast cosmic voids are getting bigger with time, but we can see the smaller versions of them as far out as we can see back in time, pretty much to the dawn of the Universe, and it wouldn't be plausible that life could have existed then, let alone be flying around in spaceships. We've also found a lot more of these massive voids in years since we found some of the more particularly anomalous supervoids, such as the Buddha's Void, also known as the Great Nothing, and we tend to figure these occasional supervoids just happen to be where two or more voids expanded into each other. And yes, they are expanding but they are expanding at the same rate as everything else in the Universe is expanding, so in this case, while it meets the condition of the time elapse argument, it doesn't seem to indicate anything artificial in that expansion. I should not underplay just how huge and empty these things are. As an example, the aforementioned Buddha Supervoid is over 300 million light years across and its center is only about twice that far away from us. Were we at the center of it, we would literally not have known of the existence of the rest of the Universe till less than a century ago when our telescopes got much better. Now it isn't empty, there are galaxies in there, probably a couple thousand of them, though we've only cataloged a handful, but as an example, your typical galaxy filament, the huge complexes of galactic superclusters between the voids, and which are about the same size scale, would generally have tens or hundreds of thousands of galaxies in it, and are smaller in volume than the voids too. So the voids aren't empty but they are pretty empty compared to the space between galaxies, inside galactic cluster, supercluster, galaxy filaments and walls. So we can rule out the voids and supervoids as being indicative of life, they might well have civilizations in them but the voids themselves are not a telltale signature of them. As we learned more about them they didn't really seem at odds with our understanding of the early Universe, quite to the contrary, and their expansion is simply mundane universal expansion their emptiness merely a mark of being lower density rather than hidden materials and invisible civilizations. What about disappearing stars though, one that might be turning into Dyson Swarms? Well, first, we have to recognize that this is many different phenomena. For instance, a star cataloged as having a brightness or apparent magnitude of say 10 back in 1920 a century ago would be one that you couldn't see with the naked eye but was well inside the range of any modest telescope. There are billions of such stars, and virtually none have a name other than the catalog reference, 
someone looking at it now might see one there with an apparent magnitude of 12 and simply assume it was a different star. They do move a bit with time and errors get made in reporting them, indeed a lot of stars get found and recorded because someone pointed a telescope that way, saw something, jotted down its coordinates and magnitude, and sent those to an observatory for confirmation. If it's a mundane star, simply put, nobody cared. Astronomers and astrophysicists do not care about any star that isn't particularly interesting because there are so many of them. A report of one with no interesting properties is as exciting as finding an oak tree in a national park. In theory someone at an observatory looked there and confirmed all the data was right, but people being people and astronomy having a lot of variability and uncertainty, it might have been a magnitude 12 star originally and just mistakenly got recorded as a 10 and nobody cared till someone saw it a century later and thought it was anomalous. Now that's just a mundane example of human error or equipment limitations and we have some more mysterious examples of disappearing stars we'll get to, but don't ever underestimate such errors and their frequency in science. Someone finds some stars a century back all near each other in the sky, their estimate of brightness is a little shaky, a lazy observatory assistant tasked with the boring task of confirming them sees they are there and the brightness is about right, and a century later someone else sees them, more accurately sees their brightness a bit lower than originally reported, and folks say, look, a bunch of dimming stars are in proximity to each other, that could be a sign of a growing interstellar civilization dimming those stars by Dyson Swarm Englobement. Even though those stars are in the same direction but one is a few hundred light years away and another is a few thousand, implying any civilization actually colonizing that region opted to skip millions of closer candidate stars to do that Dyson englobement. Of course that's the thing to keep in mind with Dyson swarms, if you build such things, you don't skip nearer stars, even if they're not ideal copies of your native star with no decently habitable planets to terraform unless they are dangerously unstable or in a chaotic neighborhood and maybe not even then. A civilization going up the Kardashev scale has abandoned planets as a center for life in favor of alternatives like O'Neill cylinders, or for post-biological civilizations, massive orbiting computer complexes, and while rare gems of systems with ideally habitable planets might be treasured, they aren't skipping other systems, just prioritizing those gems a bit. Also, while we usually picture them as growing blobs of darkness, expanding out from their homeworld in a rough sphere, that doesn't mean that patch of sky goes utterly dark, even ignoring that it's actually going infrared anyway, because a sphere a hundred light years wide of Dyson Swarm stars still has stars out past it or before it that we'd still be seeing from that direction. What else causes stars to appear to disappear though, besides observational error that is? Well we don't just have astronomer eyeballs to work with, we often had photographic plates and we found some where the plate showed a star brighter than what was there now. Stars often do vary a bit in brightness over time and can flare for any number of reasons, like something smacking into them, nor are such old plates ultra reliable for data, but it is important to keep scale in mind. If an event happened on average once every million years that brightened a star for a century, then one in 10,000 stars, if photographed at random, would be undergoing that at any given time, and looked at a century later would seem freakishly dim. There would be millions of such stars doing that in our galaxy at any given moment. Similarly dimming events, like an obscuring debris cloud, could cause false appearances of dimming too. But we do have entire classes of stars like pulsars, variable stars, or the recently identified hot subdwarf pulsators that can change brightness rather largely over time increments, either irregularly or with high precision timing of repetition. And of course you could have both, a star that pulsed in brightness by 10% every month and just happened to have undergone a dimming or brightening effect like a collision while we were looking at it. The odds of both being a case might be small. But our galaxy is huge, giving us a sample size of hundreds of billions for such free coincidences to occur. This is where we approach such anomalies under the Fermi Paradox by asking why we'd only see one sign of potential artificial origin, rather than several. For instance, you know you're near a human city when you have a large light glow at nighttime from all the streets and window lights in that city, it's a sign of artificial origin, but you'd also expect to see at least a couple more such signatures like a spike in thermal infrared from all the artificial heat and energy of that city, or a spike in radio transmissions, which even if you can't decipher them or see a pattern in them because they're encrypted or very compressed, still would be around as a spike in the amount of transmission. I don't need to be able to make out individual conversations in a crowded room of people to know folks are talking, there's a loud buzz. So if you find a dimming star, you check its neighbors to see if any of them are dimming, 
You check that star and those neighbors for anomalous amounts of LWIR emission, extra radio waves, and so on. Key notion incidentally is that a Dyson Swarm can be built very fast, especially a simple solar collector that might be thin sheets of material constructed and assembled in mere years by automated robots disassembling a handful of decent sized asteroids for raw materials, as we discussed last week in our episode Let's Dismantle the Solar System. But this still takes time and effort, and long before you've got your Dyson Swarm up to even blocking a mere 1% of the star's brightness, and we could barely notice such a dimming, you have all the power and energy to launch huge interstellar colonization fleets. After all, 1% of our Sun's energy is still 20 million times the amount of energy Earth receives from the Sun, which we don't use very efficiently either. So such a civilization, what we call a K1.8 in this case, two orders of magnitude beneath a 4K2 or K2.0 civilization, already dwarfs in power and scale what we usually see in science fiction when talking about huge galactic empires of a million worlds. If you found one that has dimmed enough in a century to be noticeable to us as definitely not a recording error, you found a civilization with sufficient energy and construction capacity to have already started that process around all their neighboring stars their ships could have reached in that time and done so rather easily. In short, if they're dimming that quickly it means they are fast growing and quite capable of interstellar colonization, and aren't even a little interested in subtlety so you'd expect to see all the stars near them begin showing those dimming characteristics. More importantly, since these dimming stars are all fairly near us in the galaxy and dimming just recently, it would be a freaky coincidence for there not to be tons more such civilizations that did that long before now, and that raises the Dyson Dilemma, as the galaxy should be packed with such rapidly expanding civilizations or rather daughter colonies of that first civilization in the galaxy to have started such an expansion a billion or more years before anyone else had a chance, if there's one out there. I often get asked about the animations we use on the episodes and I do make some myself but many more are done by graphic artists who volunteer their time on the show or from stock footage sources. And if you got some animation or graphics background and some free time and want to help out, just drop me a line on the email or post on the About page for the channel. If you're interested in learning how to do animation or graphic design though, it can often be kind of intimidating at first as it often has a steep learning curve. But there are some great courses on the topic over at Skillshare, including a series on making motion graphics from our friends over at Kurzgesagt in a nutshell. As usual for them, they are excellent at squeezing important information into quick but understandable packages to help you get started on animating and there are many more great animation courses on Skillshare, along with thousands of other courses on a wide variety of useful and interesting topics. Perhaps you're trying to adjust to working in a new environment or just looking to pick up some new skill or hobby, Skillshare has a course for it. Whether you're a beginner, a pro, a dabbler, or a master, Skillshare has thousands of classes on a wide variety of topics from experts to help you learn. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take their next step in their creative journey, and members get unlimited access to thousands of inspiring classes with hands-on projects and feedback from a community of millions. If you'd like to give it a try, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a two-month free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Act now and start learning today. So a common answer to the Fermi Paradox is that advanced civilizations arise a lot but tend to collapse, and next week we'll be taking a look at the popular science fiction trope of techno-barbarians, civilizations existing in a post-apocalyptic time using an anachronistic combination of primitive and advanced technology. But before that we'll have our monthly livestream Q&A on Sunday, July 26, 4pm Eastern US Time. Those will finish us out for the month of July but we'll be back in August starting with a look at superconductors, what they are, how they work, and what the impact of them is and will be if we ever get ones that work at room temperature. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes you can donate to us on Patreon or our website IsaacArthur.net which are linked in the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week!